Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the kickoff of our Black History Month celebration. I have the honor and privilege of introducing our guest, Mr. Bakari Sellers. He made history at just 22 years old as the youngest member of the South Carolina legislature and the youngest African-American elected official in the nation. His book, My Vanishing Country, has been an insightful and powerful part of our upper school curriculum, as well as our, our faculty and staff summer reading. Thank you, Mr. Sellers, for being with us this morning and giving us this opportunity. Liam in Brooklyn, I'll give it to you. Okay, Mr. Sellers, just to hop right in, what would you consider the most important event in shaping your ability to stay strong while facing adversity and failure? I mean, goodness, you no pleasantries, huh? After the introduction, <laughs> you just hop right in, seriously. All right. Uh, you remind me of Chris Cuomo with these questions. So, uh, you know, I think that one of the things that I go back to is the most important day of my life, which was February 8th, 1968. And it's a bit of irony that it's the most important day of my life because it was, um, you know, 20 years before I was born. Um, I think about my father's struggle often. Um, you know, he was uh, someone shot that night. Three young men were killed, Henry Smith, Samuel Hammond, and Delano Middleton. Um, 28 others were wounded. Uh, my father was arrested and uh, my father uh, spent a little, some time on death row. Um, you know, it was just a, it was, it was a night filled with injustice. And I think about everything that those individuals had to go through, the price they had to pay. Even in South Carolina, I think about names like George Elmore. Uh, who lost everything for his right to vote. I think about Sarah Mae Fleming, who sat down on a bus before um, Rosa Parks. I think about Harry and Eliza Briggs, who laid the foundation for uh, uh, not just Briggs v. Elliott, but Brown versus the Board of Education. I think about all of these individuals, and then uh, you know, remember that no matter what comes my way, I have to be able to remain strong and steadfast and, and move forward. So being the son of Cleveland Sellers, did you ever feel pressure to continue the work that your father had done? No pressure. Um, but I, you know, I felt like that's my charge. Um, I was speaking with Marlon Kempson recently, State Senator Marlon Kempson, who just lost his father, Milton, um, over the weekend. And Milton actually went from sharecropper um, mm -hmm. to uh, running uh, HHS, or Department of uh, Health and Human Services in the state of South Carolina. I mean, that... That's in, and his son is a, a state senator. I mean, that's a, that's a crazy story, but that just shows you the history we have in this, in this state. And um, I was just, we were reminiscing on the fact that that is our charge. It's not pressure. Um, and, you know, when you're a child of the movement, you look at things through a different perspective and a different lens. And that lens for me is to um, help as many people and do as much as I can along the way. So you found your purpose through learning about the Orangeburg Massacre as you were growing up, and obviously growing up with this movement. How do you think leaders in general find their purpose? Um, that's a good question. Usually it just happens along the way. I mean, I always tell folk, especially older folk, not you two and not the students listening, but to kind of get out the way of young folk because we always find our niche. I, don't, I didn't find mine until college. Uh, when I was working for United States Congressman Jim Clyburn and Atlanta Mayor Shirley Franklin. So um, it was just a it, was a, it was it was a unique time for me and I just fell in love with politics. It was just a, it was, it was a surreal moment to spend time on Capitol Hill and to um, learn the ins and outs of, of the United States Capitol. So uh, it comes in due time, I guess, is my best advice on that. Now, when you went to Morehouse, your, the colleges you attended, were there any experiences that you think set you up for your position today? Yeah, student government. No doubt about it. I was student government president. I was uh, junior class president. And those leadership positions gave me that opportunity. They gave me that, they gave me that foundation. They gave me my start. I actually ran for ninth grade president at uh, Heathwell Hall. It was one of the only races I ever lost. <laughs> it wasn't my loss, it was my classmates' loss. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think that if you'd been born in a blue state rather than a red state, you would have followed the same path that you have today? That's a good question. I try not to think about that one. I just, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, South Carolina is an interesting state politically. Um, you know, I don't, 
I, I love the challenges that I face here in South Carolina. I don't know if my path, I'm pretty sure my path wouldn't be the same if I was in a Maryland or a New York or New Jersey. Um, but I like chipping away at the glass. I, I ran statewide in 2014, and um, that was, for me, that was just, it was like, it was the beginning of something that would eventually happen. So I ran in 2014. Um, then you had Andrew Gillum, my good friend Andrew, and Stacey Abrams uh, soon thereafter. And then you had uh, uh, Jamie Harrison just recently. And finally, you had Raphael Warnock able to, to break and shatter that glass. So I just feel like I was a part of a long line of people who was chipping away at the glass. Do you feel like you have a responsibility to South Carolina? Of course. The blood of my family literally runs through the state, you know, this, the soil of this great state. Uh, my father gave so much. Um, I remember in 2000, um, in 2000, I actually marched. I, I didn't march all the way from Charleston, but I was a part of that march from Charleston to Columbia to take down the Confederate flag. Um, I remember um, uh, my good friend Clemente Pinckney in 2015 dying in a church along with eight others um, on a Wednesday night in Bible study, uh, murdered by Dylan Roof. Um, you know, I think about all these things and it's just, I, it just, I, ha I have no choice but to uh, be a part of the change I want to see here in this great state. So many people have poured into me. Um, so many people have uh, gave, given what Abraham Lincoln calls um, the last full measure of devotion. Um, as you hear my twins run by. Um, it's just a, it's a, for me, it's no other choice but to, um, it's, for me, it's no other choice but to give as much as I can. And you've mentioned a lot of, in previous interviews in your documentary, this insanity of being a Democrat in the deep south red state of South Carolina. How do you persevere when your own colleagues refused to listen to you? Yeah, it's the insanity. So there, there, there are two different types of insanity. You know, for me, it was going to work every day thinking that I was going to be able to change things. I mean, and that, that still is. If I was still in the General Assembly today, I wouldn't, first of all, I wouldn't go back to the South Carolina General Assembly. But if I was still there, it would still be the same type of work. You got to take that same attitude that you're going to be able to go in and, and, and change the world around you. There's no doubt about that. So that, that's kind of that's kind of first. The second is people in South Carolina want change, but they continue to send the same type of leadership and the same people back and forth to the State House and back and forth to the United States Capitol. Um, both of those, I believe, are the definition of insanity. You know, just uh, wanting. Okay, Mr. Sellers, you've cut out for a little bit. Okay, I'm not sure if you can hear us on your side, but you have frozen. I think Tech Crew Behind is going to start working on this. Just want to let you know that we can't hear you um, and the screen has frozen. So if you'll just give us a second to try to figure out what's going on. There we go. There we go. Okay, sorry. Yeah, that last answer was kind of cut out. But you were. Oh, I was just. I was. Yeah, I was actually ranting, so it's probably getting <laughs> cut out. No, I was just saying that the the you know in South Carolina we still have a quarter of shame. Um, we have hospitals that are closing down. You have poverty, which is rampant. I mean, the number one cause of children not ha attaining any level of academic success in South Carolina is because of hunger. That should not be the case. We have people that live in food deserts. We have environmental injustices. You know, I'm in Denmark. I'm from Denmark where we don't even have clean water. So, you know, the insanity that we display by sending the same people to Columbia every single day, um, it actually, uh, we, we see the benefits or lack thereof um, and what happens in our state on a daily basis. 
So um, do you think that policy can change the social mindset? That's an interesting question. I think, I think that policy, yeah, I mean, I guess the answer to that is yes. Policy can improve individuals' plight. For example, I, I think from a truly policy perspective, since that's what you asked, I don't think that you can have uh, race-neutral policy that affects race-specific problems. For example, I think one of the worst uh, political dogmas is rising tides lift all boats. Um, you know, that's just not the case when certain people don't have boats or they have holes in their boats. I mean, that's just purely asinine. I also think that people have to have a fundamental understanding of the difference between equality and equity. Um, and a lot of people miss, to use a horrible pun, a lot of people miss that boat. Um, so, um, you know, or horrible wordplay, not necessarily a pun. So it's just, it's a, when you, when you are governing and you, you're not necessarily governing to, um, uh, to, that's a very interesting question. You're, you're governing to improve people's social mobility. And the way that you do that is to make sure that you are uh, really, really hitting the heart of the problems and the ills that are facing society. And especially when we have issues around race, people dodge those or, and, and try to duck those all the time. So why do you think that a lot of these efforts to promote human rights turn political in our society? Give me an example. So um, people wanting to wear Black Lives Matter apparel, how that's turned into a more of a political thing when they're really just trying to express the message behind the movement. I mean, I think that would be a question that I would pose to you. Um, but I just think that there's a great deal of ignorance. And I think that uh, you know, racism is, is something that we have yet to deal with head on um, in our society. And, you know, I, I give the perfect example. My daughter's 15 years old, and I wish she could be more like Barron Trump every day. I wish she didn't have to reaffirm the basic levels of her humanity. I wish she didn't have to go out and protest and wear a sign that said Black Lives Matter. But at the end of the day, when you are uh, black in this country, there is a question. And this is where we have to be focused and be and hone in. There is a question about the value of black lives in this country. There's not a question about the value of white lives. There's, not, there's, there's no such thing as blue lives, but there's not a question about the value of, of any other lives. But there are a question about the value of black lives. And what do you mean by that, Bakari? Well, good question. Um, you see George Floyd in the street for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Now, I know neither of you can put your knee in the back of the neck of a human being, or let alone even a dog, for eight minutes and 46 seconds. I know no one watching this can do that for eight minutes and 46 seconds. But um, you know that there, there are individuals in this country, whether or not it's Ahmaud Arbery or Breonna Taylor or George Floyd, or whether or not it's Clemente Pinckney or whomever, who um, you know, we'll just see as being less than human. And we have to get to um, the, the genesis of that and root that cancer out. And uh, your question is good because it makes us deal with these more layered, more difficult questions that we have to tackle. And a moment ago, you mentioned this difference between equality and equity. Do you think you could explain what those two words mean to you? Sure, equality is giving everyone the same. Um, equity is giving people what they need. And I think that the best way to um, describe it, I'm pretty sure that many of your teachers have seen this example, and some of you all probably have seen this example as well. But if you have, um, if you have two people, one is 6'2 and one is 5'2, and they're looking over a fence, and the 6'2 person gets the same size box as the 5'2 person, the 5'2 person still can't see over the fence, but the 6'2 person sees further. With the same size box, that's called equality. Equity is allowing that 5'2 person, their box, to be taller so they too can see over the fence. And the 6'2 and 5'2 person have the same vantage point. Does that make sense? That makes sense, yes. And just to shift gears a little bit. Sure. The Orangeburg massacre happened before you were born, but you experienced a mother Manuel Amy church shooting. Mm -hmm. What was it like growing up with a shooting during your father's life and then living through a very similar event yourself? It was, it was, um, I want to say depressing because I wasn't depressed, but it was a harsh realization um, that we've made progress in this country, but we still have so far to go. 
At the time, my father was 70 and I was 30, and we were having too many of the same shared experiences. I knew Clem really well. I remember that day vividly. I write about it. I, I remember I was in Charleston. I was two blocks away from the shooting. I was at a fundraiser for Hillary Clinton. And um, just imagining somebody walking into a church. And Clem went out the way you would expect him to. I mean, he was so gracious, filled with so much grace. And, um, you know, he let this straggly white boy he'd never seen before with a backpack come and sit beside him and worship. And they were praying. And they, they, they prayed and worshiped with him for a full hour. And then as they were doing the benediction, as they were closing out, you know, Clem uh, bowed his head. He set this gentleman right beside him. They bowed their head. He shot Clem first in the neck, went around and shot eight others. Um, stood over one member of the church and said, I would kill you, but I want, um, I want there to be somebody to tell the story. Um, and, and Clem actually, many people don't know this, Clem, Clem's wife, Jennifer, was actually, um, um, she was in a church with uh, one of his daughters. Um, we had to get them out of the church and uh, Clem made it to, he actually lived to get to the hospital, but he subsequently died at the hospital. And it was just a, it was a, there was so much about it, you know, the two days later when he's enveloped in the Confederate flag, um, the fact he got both, uh, Burger King when they arrested him. I don't know if y'all remember that, but they took him to get Burger King after they mm -hmm. arrested him. You know, George Floyd, <laughs> George Floyd got killed for allegedly passing a $20 bill that was fake. He didn't even know it was fake. And Dylan Roof, after murdering nine people in the church, got Burger King. Um, so it was just so much about that moment. There was so much pain in that moment. I'll never forget being in Charleston. It was so hot. Y'all know how hot it, get, it gets in Columbia. But it was like humid hot. We were changing shirts like twice a day down there. And all the media was already there because um, of the presidential election. And Hillary was there and like Marco, not Marco Rubio, Rick Santorum was there. Um, there were so many candidates back then. I guess Marco Rubio ran for president and Marco Rubio was there. Um, yeah, they were all there and it was just, it was, it was just this huge convergence of the entire world. And it was hard. It was also um, Father's Day weekend. And having to think about those little girls uh, not being able to tell their father Happy Father's Day was just a, a lot. So it was a lot of pain and, and uh, Clem and I were really, really close. One of my last stops on my race for lieutenant governor was uh, <clears throat> not at Mother Emanuel, but at a church in St. George that he used to pastor at. And so, um, you know, we miss him every single day, but that was a moment that you realize that we still have so far to go in this country. You had people who were killed for no other reason um, than the color of their skin in a place of worship. So you mentioned that we have a lot of work to do and that events like this keep repeating. Um, in order mm -hmm. to prevent history from repeating itself, how should we go about prosecuting and denouncing individuals like Dylan Roof without giving them a platform to spread hate? You know, I, I don't think, if you wait until Dylan Roof, then you've waited too long. Mm -hmm. I think that it has to start with individuals like you and your classmates, if not younger. I think we have to have honest conversations. I think that we have to start treating people and giving people the basic benefit of their humanity. We got to start treating people with respect, no matter what they look like. And at the end of the day, I mean, it's not going to be incumbent upon the three of us, I, I would think. I mean, I think that, um, you know, white students are going to have to have conversation with white students about how do we improve um, and how do we, um, how do we make sure that, that going forward, uh, we're having tough conversations because at the end of the day, we all want equality. And it's not to say that we don't need to be involved in those conversations. It's just that sometimes we aren't the best messenger. Um, I think that we have to have tough and challenging conversations and we have to stop seeking out news and opinions that reinforces our own. We have to begin to have conversations that are difficult with others who don't look like us and don't think like us. We have to watch news that sometimes doesn't agree with us. And we have to understand that everybody's not going to think the same way, and that's okay. Um, but even when we don't agree, we don't have to be disrespectful or rude. And the biggest, one of the biggest problems we have is social media because everybody wants to be a troll and everybody thinks they can say absolutely anything they want to say uh, without any repercussion or consequence. And it's eroding the fabric of this country. And I just think that we have to do a better job of treating people with respect, having dignity, and giving people their humanity. 
I mean, talking about social media, Twitter just took off Donald Trump from their platform. Do you think that was the correct response if his tweets were inciting violence? I think at the time, yeah. I mean, I, there's no question. I, I'm a unique person to ask about inciting violence, I guess, because my father went to prison for rioting. He was, <laughs> he's the first and only one man riot in the history of this country, right? Um, so I've seen the, the injustice behind that. But I do think that, um, you know, well, let's back up. I mean, we literally had an insurrection at the Capitol. It's not just something that, hap you know, that we can just, you know, move forward. Um, you actually had a law enforcement officer who died in the Capitol. You had others who were beaten with hockey sticks and batons. You had um, people wearing um, um, anti-Semitic shirts. You had people carrying Confederate flags in the United States Capitol. They stormed the Capitol. They had zip ties. Uh, this is something that just cannot go um, unaddressed. Uh, more people died in in the. January 6th insurrection, and more Americans died in the January 6th insurrection than died in Benghazi. So, I mean, let's just keep, and you had Madison Cawthorn and, and the president, et cetera, um, you know, utilizing their pulpit to tell people to go storm the Capitol. People literally said they were only there because of them. So I think that it's fair um, at this time. I think that if Twitter ever makes a decision, I know Jack very well. Um, Jack would be an interesting person for you all to invite to speak to your class, even virtually. Uh, Jack's a cool dude, Jack Dorsey, the, the CEO and founder of Twitter. Um, and I know how difficult that was because you never want to ban anyone. But when you have something as violent as the insurrection that happened on the 6th, something that's as anti-American as that, you have to take swift action. So you mentioned the violence that happened on the 6th. Do you think that the ends always justify the means? No, apparently not. I mean, that, I think that, no. Uh, and I, you know, I think that uh, I, I know that, that there are going to be some people who are like, well, you know, you had protests and riots after George Floyd was um, murdered. And I'm, I, I always chuckle at that because it reminds me, and people always like to quote King, but King once said that rioting is, a, you condemn rioting, but rioting is the voice of the unheard. And you can't condemn the riots unless you condemn the, the, uh, the underlying circumstances that led to it, right? And so think about the underlying circumstances that led to um, the protest in the streets in um, Minnesota. And think about the underlying circumstances that led to the insurrection. The underlying circumstances in Minnesota were another black body being dead in the street. They were reacting to George Floyd's death, his murder, and sick and tired of watching these images on our TV screen. What led to the sixth? The sixth was lies about an election. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the best way to put it. Um, and so when you think about those things, I guess the answer to your question is resoundingly no, but you also look at the reasons why individuals did what they did, and if you just sit back, it really doesn't make sense. And with January 6th, do you think we should call these insurrectionists, are, are they activists or are they terrorists? They're terrorists. They're domestic terrorists. Okay. I'm sorry, that was an easy question. <laughs> well, you I'll... were looking at me like, and? <laughs> no. So, I, you know, I think that, as my light goes out, I think that we have to be very clear about the, the words and the phrases that we use. And I think that they were, um, a lot were white supremacists, domestic terrorists. And I think we have to call it as such so we can root it out as such. And to follow up to that, I want to ask is, how do you feel about the response to these domestic terrorists compared to the peaceful protesters and that happened over the summer and how we all viewed them very differently and they were treated with very different resistance, especially from law enforcement? Yeah, I mean, you saw Black Lives Matter. The protest in Washington, D.C. were met with National Guard, meant guardsmen on the steps of the Capitol. Um, but I mean, that's just, Daniel Rittenhouse killed two people in the street and then walked right by law enforcement and went home. He was also dropped off by his mother, but I digress. Um, and you just saw Capitol Police letting people in. You know, that, you saw how many law enforcement were involved in the insurrection and elected officials. You had state delegates and Congress and, and state reps from Virginia and West Virginia. You had law enforcement officers from Seattle and all around. 
it's just it's it's a tough pill to swallow when you see that. Um, but it's a you know these are questions that we'll have to answer. By the way, you guys are asking some of the best, most probing questions. I hope that you guys get an opportunity not just to hear my voice, but to hear somebody else's voice who may think a little different. I think that's a good exchange of ideas. Somebody who, you know, may be a little further to the right than I. But um, I think that at the end of the day, we we have to agree that democracy is fragile, and what happened on January sixth. Um, and the incitement thereof it, it is something that should never happen in this country. And we need to, before you turn the page or have unity, you got to hold those people accountable. Everybody wants to turn the page and heal and have unity. Like, just forget about it. And the answer is no. You can't just forget about it. You have to um, have accountability and, a, and atonement before you have um, healing and turning the page. So you previously mentioned um, the interaction of law enforcement with a lot of the protesters. Mm -hmm. And over the summer, we saw Black Lives Matter protests all across the nation. South Carolina's chapter of Black Lives Matter recently started working with the police department, an entity that many Black Lives Matter activists identify as the enemy. Do you think that South Carolina Black Lives Matter working with the police is harmful? No, not at all. I think it's good. I mean, I think you have to be willing to have conversations, especially when you're talking about um, you mean you first of all we police aren't going anywhere I don't want mm -hmm. them to go anywhere I don't want to get rid of police like that's not the thing I, I never want to do that um, I just you know it's, it's kind of I just want better policing that's all I don't want no police I just want better policing I think that's what everybody wants I want it, it's amazing because we saw police de-escalate on January 6th but we, they don't de-escalate in our, um, they didn't de-escalate with Jacob Blake. They shot him in the back, you know. Um, you just see all of these situations where you, you, you don't see the de-escalation. You just see them fire shots because their life is in danger. But you saw no shots fired when a, um, a Washington, D.C. city police officer was being drugged down the steps, beating with, beaten with flagpoles. Um, but you saw de-escalation. All of those individuals came in the Capitol freely and left the Capitol freely. It, it is what it is. But to answer your question directly, I think that you have to have good conversations about how community police, making sure the police officers are in your communities, not just when they're there to arrest somebody, but um, you know, uh, uh, just building those relationships. I'm actually on my special on TNT. Um, it's called the Arena on TNT. It comes on before Charles Barkley and Kenny Smith and all of those on the NBA on TNT. This, con this Thursday, I'm having a conversation with the two Atlanta police officers, one white and one black, and we're talking about these same things of how to move our communities forward together. Um, and I just think that's the only way you can do it is by having these conversations. So do you think that any policy can help us have better policing? Or what types of policy? Oh, yeah, no question. So I think that we have to eliminate chokeholds. I think that we have to uh, limit qualified immunity whereby police officers, when they commit bad acts, they don't have any liability individually, basically the city. If a police officer were to arrest you and beat you up um, right now, he wouldn't have any liability. That liability would rest on the city of Columbia, not, not him. So there's no deterrent. I think we need to have a standardized use of force um, guidelines and training so we know what the police are being taught in uh, Richland County versus Orangeburg County versus L.A and making sure that that's standardized so we at least know what mechanisms and methods are being used and we make sure everybody's trained. We need to increase training. Um, right now, you, you go to barber school longer then you have to go to the academy to be trained. Um, and we need to have a database for bad acts. So if you commit a bad act in Columbia, you can't go to Aiken and be chief of police because right now there's nothing prohibiting you from doing that. And um, you previously mentioned having conversations about a lot of these things. What role do you think education plays in keeping history from repeating itself? I mean, I think education is the gateway to the American dream, and I think the more you're able to have great discourse like the one we're having today, although everybody may not agree, at least hopefully they're thinking, and hopefully they are you know, coming up with some you know, uh, layered ways to push back or creative thoughts, and maybe we made them think about something in a way that they didn't think about before they sat down the day for 30 minutes. So I just think that by having these experiences is the only way that we can move forward because we're not gonna get out of this ditch unless we do it together. As a political analyst, do you see yourself having to filter your speech? Never. Or Never, I, I, I've always, I always speak my truth 
And I think that's what has made me successful and that's what's gotten me uh, this far. And, you know, I, I love being on CNN. I, I love being able to travel the country. I've written one book and a children's book comes out in January um, and then another adult book next fall. So I'm, I'm just excited about, you know, what's to come. And I'm from a big city like Denmark where we got three stoplights and a blinking light. Mm-hmm. And every night I speak to over a million people and it's just the most refreshing and, um, and emboldening, empowering, daunting, um, you know, challenging experience I have. How does news coverage of rioting and protests become, that become violent and undermine the work that you've been trying to do? And sorry, let me re- uh, restart that question. So how do you think news coverage of riots and protests that become violent undermine the work that you try to do here in South Carolina? I don't, I mean, look, it doesn't necessarily undermine the work. I tell people all the time, I condemn every ounce of violence and rioting that happens, right? Um, but you got to understand why people do it. You got to understand the poverty, the pain, the death, the trauma that's behind it. And while you condemn the rioting, you also have to, you also have to condemn the conditions that led to it. And that's my only point. So many people want to be like, why did you, you know, light that bush on fire. You, um, you should be ashamed of yourself. And, you know, you should also be ashamed that there are people who the only meal they get is, you know, the free lunch program at school. And they have to steal bread and food and different things from school and take it home to feed their younger brother and sister. You should be, you should, you know, while you're mad at me for, you know, standing on top of this car or whatever or throwing a brick through a window, yeah, you should condemn that. But you should also condemn that people are working 40 hours a week and still poor. Um, so I, I think that we have to be more layered in our thinking and be able to do both. Now we've touched on it a few times during this conversation, but America has definitely become more polarized very recently. As a political analyst, how do you see your role playing into this polarization of the nation? Yeah, but America's polarized because of Capital, capital, cable news does have something to do with it, but gerrymandering has way more to do with it. The fact that right now people never have to win the center, they only have to win primaries in this country is the reason that we're so uh, polarized. I mean, the way that we draw lines, and you only have to win a Democrat or Republican primary. There are very few competitive general elections in this country, and that's because we have too many elected officials drawing their own lines. We have to get to a point where... Um, independent commissions and people like you and I draw lines, not people who are trying to get reelected. And just to um, wrap things up really quickly, what role do you see yourself playing in the future and what are you personally hoping to contribute to history? I don't know, that's still being written. I just mm-hmm. wanna um, you know, ensure that my children can grow up in a country better than the one that we have today and hopefully they one day can be free. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate this conversation. Um, Now we're going to hand it back to Ms. Zimmerman. Thank you again for this opportunity. And on behalf of our entire community, our school, our students, faculty and staff, parents, alumni, pretty much anyone that has anything to do with Heathwood Hall, we are so grateful for you giving us your time this morning and really just telling your truth and telling your story. So thank you again for being with us. Thank you, guys.